Since the dawn of human existence, we have never ceased exploring the mysteries of life. From the establishment of Mendelian genetics, to solving the double helical structure of DNA, and the completion of the Human Genome Project. Each exploration and breakthrough has propelled the rapid development of genomics and is used in the understanding and protection of all aspects of human life and health. As an innovative enterprise focusing on genomics, Novogene provides unsurpassed genomic services in fundamental scientific research, clinical diagnosis, drug development, health management, and many other fields. Innovation-driven, customer-oriented, and quality-focused, Novogene has developed a global intelligent and flexible production system to ensure a fast turnaround, accurate data, and an exceptional customer experience. Our comprehensive range of advanced products and services satisfy diverse customer requirements. Leading sequencing platform meets the demands for large-scale projects. A world-leading supercomputing data center delivers fast, accurate, and secure data. Strict international quality standards and management practices guarantee the quality of products and services. And a sophisticated global information system ensures an efficient operation and timely response. Since its inception, Novogene has established operations and laboratories across China, as well as the United States, Singapore, the United Kingdom, the Netherlands, and Japan serving more than 60 countries and regions across six major continents. Novogene has continuously improved and invested in frontier research and development. We hold numerous patents and software copyrights and publish many journal articles. At Novogene, we always uphold the values of professionalism, innovation, integrity, and partnership, committing ourselves to be the global leader in providing genomic services and solutions to find the beauty in the numerous yet delicate code of life, to fulfill and serve a better life and social progress of mankind in the long run, to create a greater future. Advancing genomics, improving life. Novogene. Hello everyone. A great afternoon to all of you. Welcome to our special webinar on spectrum of single cell sequencing from single cell RNA-seq to spatial transcriptomics. This is Dahlia Te, Marketing Manager of Novogene AIT Genomics, your moderator for the session. The video featured earlier would have given you a snapshot of Novogene. We are a fast-growing organization. In just nine years from year 2011, we have established global presence with laboratories in China, US, Singapore, Netherlands, and Japan, serving more than 60 countries and regions across six major continents. We pride ourselves in research and development, continuously providing value and solutions tailored for our customer needs. And Falcom is our proudest milestone of this year a fully automated delivery platform that could process up to 3,000 samples in 24 hours, reducing the human error. And that stood us out from the competition to deliver reliable and high quality data at a faster turnaround time to our customers. The highlight here is our newest product launch to the market, the spatial transcriptomics and the single cell solutions presenting you a whole new perspective in the approach of your analysis for research and clinical studies. Well, thank you for joining us. We're so glad to have special guest speakers from the Genomics Institute of Singapore, Kyoto University, and 10X Genomics on a topic that's so interesting for everyone in the research and clinical studies. The single cell technology and the new phase of spatial analysis for genome-wide expression studies. We hope you will gain new insights after this. This webinar is brought to you by Novogene, broadcasting live from our Amir branch office here in Singapore. Before we move on, I'd like to cover some of the basic tools and the Zoom platform that you can use during the webinar. 
As an attendee, you can virtually raise your hand or submit a question in the Q&A for us to attend to you at an appropriate time. The webinar consists of three presentations of 15 to 20 minutes for each speaker, followed by a Q&A session. And in between, we'll conduct two poll survey for discussion. Stay tuned to the end, as our presenters will address some questions submitted during the registration. Okay, I've been doing all the talking and this is me. And with me here is my colleague, Xiao Hui. She is the scientific um, application manager who has all the expertise to assist me with questions pertaining to the products and services of Novogene uh, offering on single cells and spatial transcriptome. She will be here as a panelist. Hi, Xiao Hui, how are you doing? Uh, I'm perfectly well. Thank you so much. I'm so happy I can be here together with our special guest speakers and audience out here on a common topic. Thank you. And yes, I'm glad to be doing this with you again. And hey guys, if you have not watched our previous webinar on a practical guide or RNA sequencing, so we talk about the wide range of RNA seq application and challenges for research methodologies and the management of a successful pipeline. It is available to watch it on our website or YouTube. Here are our presenters, uh, Dr. Shaim Prahapka, Dr. Watanabe Akira, and Dr. Min Tan. Hello to you, and thank you for joining us to share your knowledge with all of us here today. How are you guys doing? Hi, Dalia. Thanks for having us here, Dalia. Great to be here. Thanks for the invite. Um, really interesting to note how NGS has evolved through the years. Each new technology emerge aims to target precisions for analysis. Single cell technology can be used to detect the genome, transcri transcriptome, and other omics of single cell, and we see an increasingly use in various fields. And to the speakers, how do you see the potential of single cell technology and spatial analysis on clinical applications, particularly on therapy and diagnosis? Um, any speakers? Maybe Dr. Shine? Uh, I think that's a huge question and hope to get everyone's inputs on that. Uh, single cell analysis started out primarily as a research, you know, basic research and technology. But of course, like all genomic technologies, eventually it starts becoming relevant in the clinic. So from our perspective, the work that we do in my lab, the most obvious things that we are using, and I'll give some examples of that. We're using single cell analysis to identify biomarkers and disease mechanism. Now, these biomarkers could be diagnostic markers. They could be prognostic markers. They could be for monitoring. Or they could be therapeutically targetable markers, right? So I think uh, single cell is a great tool for uh, research and discovering diagnostics and discovering new drug targets. That's one. And, and then... Discovery is one thing, right? Can single cell also be used for uh, as an assay in the clinic? And that's the next step. I, it's even a few a couple of years ago, it seemed a bit like sci-fi, but uh, there is actually, I think there are a few groups in the world already developing single cell methods for use in the clinic. And of course, if you zoom out a little bit, you can say, well, Fax is a single cell method and fax has been used in the clinic. But I'm, I'm talking about more, more high throughput methods right now, such as what we'll talk about today. So then uh, using it as a diagnostic in the clinic, for example, I think there's a lot of exi exciting single cell technologies now. Some of them work with FFP samples. So that makes it directly usable in the clinic. Some of them need fresh samples, but still they're developing um, kind of low throughput versions of traditionally high throughput whole transcriptome or whole genome methods. These are low throughput single cell assays that you can use to profile just the relevant biomarkers that you're interested in. So you can imagine instead of doing facts with say 10 markers and now even 40 markers, you can do single cell RNA-seq with let's say 100 markers, still relatively inexpensive, but um, you know, uh, you can quickly generate data and analyze it and return a result in a reasonable amount of time. So I see single cell analysis increasingly making inroads in diagnostics as well in the clinic. Okay, thank you, Dr. Shan. 
Okay, we'll see what uh, the presenters here will be talking more about this. So um, our first presenter is Dr. Min Tan from 10X Genomics, Regional Marketing Manager. Um, 10X Genomics is a extremely fast-growing biotech company that designs and manufactures gene sequencing technology used in scientific research. And what Min will be sharing with all of us here will be on the topic, Uncover the Hidden Complexity of Biology with Single-Cell and uh, Spatial Solutions. Let's welcome him. Thanks, Dalia, for the um, great introduction. Let me just share my screen. Hopefully, this is the right one. Um, Okay, hope you all can see my screen and uh, you can hear me well. Yeah, thanks again for the invitation. It's great to um, be with all of you. Uh, and, and thanks to my fellow speakers as well. Uh, it's great to see uh, Dr. Watanabe and, and Dr. Sham. And, uh, and also good to know that you guys are strong supporters of 10X technology. I'm looking forward to working closer with you uh, as we move forward as well. Um, so as, as what Dali mentioned, I'm here actually to speak a bit about using both single cell and spatial uh, technologies. We're really happy to, to work with uh, Novogen AIT and, and great to know that they have started and, and uh, hopefully I, I don't uh, uh, ruffle any feathers by saying uh, finally started um, uh, having a serv uh, being a service provider for our single cell and spatial technology. So looking forward to big things from, from uh, both of us. So for those of you who don't know 10X, um, we are a relatively young company. If you look at our product timeline, um, if this was uh, our, we launched our first product 15 years ago. Uh, sorry, in 2015, five years ago. And in that short five years, we've been very, very innovative, launching a lot, a slew of single cell products, which I'll talk about some today. Um, we also launched two uh, instruments. One would be the Chromium controller and one would be the automated Chromium Connect that, that was really uh, earlier this year. And last but not least, we, we launched our spatial transcriptomics or spatial uh, technology platform, which is the vision, which I will talk a, a bit more about uh, later in my presentation. Too. And we are really encouraged to see that a lot of researchers and scientists such as yourself um, have, uh, have embraced our technology. We are inching towards 2000 publications, which we probably will hit um, in, in the next couple of months. So uh, looking forward to a new slide on this, this case, but you know, this, this is just to share with you that there, there are a lot of your peers that are using your technology and a lot of them have published in very, very high impact uh, journals. So, you know, I, I really like this slide because it gives you a very good snapshot of what, um, how we see the platforms uh, that we have. So if you think about starting with a single, uh, single uh, slide of tissue, right? If you want to extract RNA from that single slide, uh, bulk RNA and um, do a, an RNA seq experiment. Basically, you end up with one data point right, of, of, of one single transcriptome. But if you're able to get look at that same tissue uh, section and dissociate the cells and look at the transcriptome of each of those single cells, then you'll be able to have all these different data points depending on how many cells you are able to analyze. And in this depiction, um, segregate them or cluster them or group them into different cell types um, depicted by the different colors here. For the visium or the spatial example, Basically, you do not need to dissociate. What you have would be you, you will try to you, you will try to identify the trans transcriptome of each of these individual spots or cells in those spots um, on the tissue slide itself, right? And I'll show you a bit on uh, share with you a little bit on uh, tanks technology for 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 vision. So going uh, a bit into the chromium single cell, which I'll talk a bit about for uh, a few slides before I move into the vision slides. So there are two aspects to this technology um, that's really crucial. First, we have a system that's able to um, able to split these cells. So if you can see here, these, these are uh, depicts the cells and, and, and the big colored um, dots depict the beads, which I'll talk about in the next slide. And the whole idea is that you have all these cells encapsulated in, in oil uh, and, and cop up and utilized with one cell, generally one cell with one bead, right? What we are able to do then is then um, collect all these separate single cells. And then after you perform a few, some library preparation steps within the, the, the capsules, and then you'll be able to pull them by, by breaking apart these uh, all uh, emulsion, emulsions. So the other part of the secret sauce, so to speak, is our beads, right? So we, we call this, um, we call this the, the beads uh, with the cells um, gems. And basically the secret is that there's this uh, a bead and on, on it, uh, a lot of oligos and and in this case there are three species of oligos and uh, the first species will be the one that has a poly dt and this will be able to capture all your poly a transcripts 
um, identify and tag them with the unique molecular identifiers. And of course, the 10x barcode that will then identify that these, um, these uh, transcripts are from uh, associated with this particular beat, single beat. We also have two other capture sequences, which I will not touch on that much today. And this will enable our feature barcode technologies. Um, I have one slide at the end, uh, near the end of this section on this. So if you look at the workflow, it's really simple, right? First, you start off with your cells that have already been dissociated into single cells. And then you load that onto our Chromium uh, platform. And this is a, a picture of the chip, the Chromium chip. And basically the box is a really, really small box. It's smaller than, than, a, than a normal uh, a printer, right? And you know, these Chromium instruments will then generate these gems for which you can then produce your libraries. And this will feed into the sequencing instrument um, that uh, Novagene has. And then uh, we also provide the analysis and visualization platforms, Cell Ranger and Loop Browser, um, which you will be able to use to, uh, to come up with the publication quality images, which I'll show you a couple later. And of course, these two, uh, the data output from these two software will also be uh, amenable to uh, community and tools, uh, analysis by community tools. So I want to show you one example of, of what can be done. So this was an example in 2018 by Aviv Raghav and the uh, Retrical Power Groups at the road. And basically what they found when they, when they um, did a single cell uh, transcriptomic analysis of the uh, trachea for mouse lungs, they found a very, very small group of cells that they now, they called um, ionocytes. And this is 0.5% uh, of all cells. So to put this into context, every 1,000 cells that you analyze in, in this, this experiment, only five of these cells will be ionocytes. So these are very, very, very rare. But what's really interesting is that these ionocytes on their own, uh, they will express more than 50% of the lung cystic fibrosis uh, in, in transcripts um, within the, 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 the tissue that they have they've analyzed. Right, so, and for those of you who know, you know cystic fibrosis is, uh, it is a very key gene that has been uh, researched on uh, by by many many uh, by many many scientists, um, and it was thought to be um, it was thought to be expressed by ciliated cells, but you know, they are finding that this is not, and this has great implications when you look at cystic fibrosis as the disease, as well as um, gene therapy um, strategies moving forward. So what you can also do with our technology is to look at um, in 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 a separate. Uh, uh, immune profiling experiment, look at either the uh, T cell repertoire or B cell repertoire, or looking at the uh, gene expression from the 5 prime end, um, or, uh, and also looking at that feature barcode aspect. So one aspect, uh, sorry, one, ex one example of this is this particular one in breast cancer from uh, this one is from uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering. And basically they, they cluster, they, they group all the cells in these three samples here, 9, 10, 11, into these uh, big so-called uh, sample. And then what they did was that they used, I think this is a T-SNE pod, to identify, to split out the different um, clusters, right? Uh, cell clusters based on their gene expression. So as you can see that they label, you know, CD8 positive T cells, CD4 positive T cells, regulatory T cells, and, and so on, right? So, so the question they asked is, does the TCR repertoire diversity contribute to observe T cell activation and phenotype diversity? And so what you can see here is that if you identify the different clonal types, in the different samples, you do see that they group into the different parts of the, um, of, of, the, of the different clusters. And from then they can identify that each cluster is comprised of different combinations of clonotypes and distinct clusters are shaped by uh, PCR repertoires. Right? So this is one of, one of the experiments that you can perform with our immune profiling um, solution. Okay, so I've been talking a, a lot about the um, transcriptome and while you can definitely do whole transcriptome analysis with our platform, what we have recently launched was the ability to also do uh, uh, targeted gene panels. So at this point in time, we have four gene targeted gene panels, as you can see here, with about a thousand genes each, um, human pan cancer, immunology, gene signature and neuroscience. And for single cells, you also have the ability to design a completely bespoke custom gene panel as well. So to give you an idea of, of the results, so what you're looking at here is 6,000 glioblastoma cells uh, run with the chromium single cell three prime gene expression workflow. If you look at the whole transcriptome, you're able to cluster using looking at this T-SNE plot, 
um, this particular sample into you know uh, these three or four different different clusters and what you what you can do is you can take an in silico subset of the genes in parallel so what we did was take this data and only look at the 200 uh, sorry 1253 genes here um, that's expressed and you can see a very very similar clustering here and when you do that experiment where you only look you only pull out the 125 uh, 1253 genes um, and you sequence it, you also get a similar type of cluster. Right. So what we're saying here is that if you know what to look at, um, and if you want to restrict yourself to a gene panel instead, you can get comparable results um, compared to the whole transcriptome. Okay, in summary, if you look at our um, 10x toolkit, what I've spoken to you earlier today would be the gene expression side of things, as well as the immune profiling. Uh, what we can also do with our feature barcoding technology is the looking at proteins, um, for example, with a technique similar to or also known as SiteSeq. Um, we're able to do CRISPR screening. Uh, we're able to, uh, and if you want to look at the nuclear uh, RNA, uh, we are also, sorry, uh, the, the nucleus as a sample, we're also able to do uh, a attack seek, single cell attack seek. And recently we came up with a multi ohm kit where you can do um, attack seek and gene expression from the same nucleus. Uh, of, uh, of course, these are for multiple nuclei, right? But the, these two data sets will be from the same nucleus. So that's really, really exciting. And last but not least, um, I would encourage you if you want to find out more, we have a, a set of master courses that we've put up on YouTube. So if you can Google, you know, uh, 10x genomics master course YouTube, you'll be able to see uh, land on this page. And, and we have seven courses at this point in time going through different parts of uh, our portfolio, including a single cell immune profiling, which I talked a bit about. Uh, yeah. So I have maybe about five more minutes. I'll share with you a little bit on the Visium um, side of things. So I'll skip through a few of these slides. So for Visium, this is uh, um, what like what I explained to you earlier on, right? You don't have to dissociate your cells. What you do is if you have a tissue uh, a tissue section, all you need to do is mount it on, onto this vision spatial gene, uh, gene expression slide and you can mount four different samples here. And this is all you need, right? Uh, which I'll show you in the next uh, workflow slide. Each of these sections consists of around 5,000 spots, right? Each of these spots are about 55 microns, which will fit about, uh, which will cover about one to, one to um, 10 cells. And these are covered with oligos as well. So very similar to our beads, these are covered, uh, these, these are uh, consists of the poly DT segment where you are able to uh, capture poly A, the, uh, the UMIs to identify the transcripts and the spatial barcode to identify which, where these spots actually are. So if you look at the workflow and this is a, a complicated slide, the only thing different would be the staining protocol here, looking at either HNE &E staining or immunofluorescence staining. In essence, again, the magic occurs really on the um, on the slide, right? So you need your cryostat, right, to to, to cut the um, tissue sections. Um, after you after you um, add the uh, or after you stain your, your sections, all you need to do is image it, right? Go un uh, undergo the library barcoding and library construction step, send it to Novagen AIT for sequencing uh, and you know, uh, data processing and data visualization. And you know, then you'll be able to look at your, your data, right? Uh, and crucially, again, all you need really would be the slide, um, and as well as of course access to your your um, sectioning equipment, imager, as well as a sequence. Okay, so this is basically what the data looks like. This is a mouse brain, and if you look at this, um, this is uh, a section. And if you look at it this way, this is sort of how the dots look like. And if you want to look at uh, any mRNA, this is how you visualize it. If you look at it on the on uh, in totality, what you can look at is total UMIs. So basically, this is looking at the unique transcripts that are expressed in each of these spots. So of course, the, the highest ones are um, uh, in red. And as you can, as you can see, uh, there's sort of like a, a low expression uh, region here. Uh, and, uh, and you can also look at the gene numbers that are expressed. So, you know, similarly, you see very high expression on the, on the, on the bottom side of this tissue. Right. So uh, again, for, for these, you have two modes of, um, to capture the data. One would be the whole transcriptome, another one would be the target gene expression. And in this example, this is roughly what you, this is what you see. So what you're looking at is the breast cancer sample. Um, and you will have uh, looking at the only 100, around 200 genes from that pan's cancer panel we talked about in two slides ago. And this is a gene expression. Uh, uh, that's how it looks like in each of these dots. And you can see the little the, the dots here, right? And each of these dots again correspond to 55 micron uh, uh, diameter. And of course, you can zoom into specific uh, genes as well. 
So um, one thing I want to highlight here is this is an example of our software, the Loop Browser, and how easy it is to use. Say, for example, this uh, you, you like to look at the hippocampus, and that is highlighted in, in this orange um, sort of staining by immunofluorescence marker. And what you can do with our software is you can select the spots that correspond to this structure or any structure that you're looking at, and then look at the gene expression of all these spots as one data point, which is what you're seeing here, or even if you want to segregate or split this up into different um, parts, for example, uh, um, these, these four spots here compared to these four spots here, um, that's something you can do with our software as well. So this is a very, very flexible uh, software that you can use. Uh, and again, uh, I believe it's really easy to, to get data from Novogene um, and then um, view this data on, on your laptop or your work laptop at home or in your lab. So I want to go a bit deeper into this to share with you uh, some data, and I think this is really interesting. So what you're looking at here is just looking at immunofluorescence data, right? Looking at Darby staining as well as pancytokeratin marker, marker, which is uh, which is a, a, a marker for um, tumor cells, as well as CD45, which is a, a leukocyte marker, which which is generally um, used to mark for stromal uh, the, the stromal segments, right? So this was what I showed you in the previous slide. Uh, and just, this is just immunofluorescence looking at protein expression. Now, if you take the Visium data and, uh, and look at it on its own, right? So basically, this is looking at all the different spots that you see here um, and only using our pan cancer targeted uh, gene panel. And if you look at the gene expression and you let the software cluster these um, spots based on gene expression, right? you can see that there's a, there's a cluster one in blue here. And this is sort of the, the structure you see. And this corresponds very, very strongly with the tumor-like uh, structure that you see here stained with uh, pan uh, cytokeratin. Right, if you look specifically at the genes, we can see that the top expressing genes and the, or rather the top over expressing genes in this cluster compared to the rest of the clusters are, you know, uh, for example, topoisomerase 2A, which is a uh, marker for proliferative uh, tumor cells, as well as expo one which can be a, a marker for um, some cancer cells. What's really interesting in, the, in this data um, is that you can see here that there's this structure here, right? In, in, in the immunofluorescence, it kind of looks like a similar one single structure. But if you take a look at the gene expression, right? You're able to see that this, is, this consists of cells that are more blue and, and red, and this consists of the cells that are, are more um, green and blue, right? So there are uh, different nuances and you can actually um, uh, look at this and in different levels and, and size and dice of data, however you, however you like, because you actually capture all the data in that whole sample at, at one time. And again, you can also look at it at an individual gene level if you want to. Okay, so um, I'm coming to my last few slides. So what I want to also share with you is um, what I've just shown you about Visium was done on fresh frozen samples. Um, and, and we are working on the Visium for FFPE solution. And we're looking at this to be coming out anytime soon, which is uh, going to be uh, early next year. Um, and I want to just end off with by, by sharing with you a few key features. You're able to do unbiased whole transcriptome analysis as well as targeted panel analysis on your tissue sections, right? Without the, the need to select regions of interest. You're able to have full tissue selection and, and coverage, right? You're able to have a high cellular resolution. We talked about you know, one to 10 cells per spot, depending on tissues, tissue type. And this is compatible with histological state, right? You're able to do that um, on the same slide. So you can look at the protein expression of that slide as well as the transcriptome, uh, transcriptomic data on that same slide and overlay the data, right? And crucially, I think a lot of people underestimate this. We, these are all kitted reagents and software that's ready to use. There's no need to, um, there, there's no need to, to do a, a homebrew method or, or, or talk to a collaborator um, or, or the, the publisher or, or first author or last author of, of papers. Uh, and all of us know, all of us know how, how challenging it is to, to get a protocol that is, um, uh, that's developed in another lab working in, in, in our own labs. So this is something that we've uh, optimized uh, with long hours working on, uh, in our R&D lab. So uh, that, that's, I think, one real benefit that, that we can definitely share with, with you. Uh, that was my last slide on Visium. Uh, happy to take any questions. But before I go, I'd like to share with you one thing. Um, we are going to have our 10 Genomics APEC virtual UGM in two weeks. So this is going to be on the 18th to 19th November from 10.30 to about 3 p.m. Singapore time. Um, we're going to have really, really exciting sessions. We have uh, three keynote sessions. Of note, uh, we, we, we managed to secure Joachim Landerberg to talk. And for those of you who know, uh, Joachim is the inventor of spatial transcriptomics. That's the technology that Visium was based on. So he's from, he, he's, he's the um, 
um, lead head of the SciLife Sci -Life lab. And it'd be great to hear him talk about you know, spatial transcriptomics and maybe in situ technology that Tenex also recently acquired um, in a couple of months ago. We also have a panel discussion talking a bit about what um, Dahlia mentioned early on about uh, the clinical aspects of single cell and spatial technology. And we have a whole set of breakout sessions as well. So please feel free to go um, to this website. Uh, apologies, I don't have a QR code for you right now, but it's tenxugm.eventextra.com um, and to register and we really look forward to seeing you at our event. So with that, uh, again, here's the website and I'd like to thank you for your attention. So back to you, Dahlia. Thank you, Dr. Min. Attendees, if you have any questions for uh, Min, here's your chance to ask him in person. Just submit your questions at the Q&A box and he will be able to address them um, during the Q&A sessions uh, towards the end. Okay, so um, here's something um, interesting for you guys. Upcoming is a poll questions that we picked from the registration. So um, please do participate as we will feature the results from the floor on screen. So here's the poll questions. Can frozen tissue be used for single cell gene expression? And this is um, um, a question that often raised. Maybe I might want to um, ask Xiaohui about this. Oh, yes, we, we received the inquiry for this frozen tissue section. Customer asking, can you use frozen tissue for the single cell gene expression? Okay, so let's um, take a look at the result polling. So um, there are 57% of you are replying yes, 17% no, and 30% unsure. Our next presenter is Dr. Shine Prahaka. Many of you would have known him for his major achievements that include the first single cell transcriptomy analysis of collateral cancer. The first large scale screen for histone acetylations, QTLs, the first histone acetolome wide association study of psychiatric disorder and the first general purpose pig detection algorithm for omics profile. He has led multiple industry collaborations and served on or chaired multiple grand panels, conference organizing committee, task forces, and steering committees related to single cell research, epigenomics, and precision medicine. And by the way, he was the sole recipient of the 2001 America Physical Society PhD thesis award for gene physics. He co-founded Human Cell Atlas Asia and is currently the Associate Director of Spatial and Single Cell System at the Genomic Institute of Singapore. He heads the Genomic Analytics for Singapore National Physicians Medicine Program. Today, he will bring us into his presentation on single cell analysis of Asian diversity and cancer cohorts. Welcome Dr. Shine and over to you. Thanks very much for the very kind introduction and uh, pleasure to be here at this webinar. Mm -hmm. Share my screen here. All right, so uh, I'm gonna talk about uh, single cell analysis in two different contexts. Of course, my lab does many more, but for the purposes of today's talk, I'll be talking about uh, Asian diversity and cancer cohorts. And in between, I'll say a little bit about algorithms. So Asian diversity, why are we talking about this? Uh, the main reason is that genomic databases are primarily European. So I've shown here on the left is GWAS studies. And uh, then NOMAD is a you know, database, you can say, of uh, genome, whole genome and exome sequencing. And down below, bottom right, is uh, GTEx, the, the Tissue and Expression uh, Genetics Consortium. Uh, in all these, you'll see that European samples predominate. Okay? So, and this, they made major efforts to uh, recruit non-European origin samples, and they have quite a diversity, but it's still predominantly European. Okay. And uh, primarily because these studies were done in Western countries. 
So what's the consequence of that? Well, disease, you know, the genomic data may be predominantly European, but diseases are not predominantly European. We all have them. And in fact, uh, you could argue Asians have different diseases from people in other parts of the world in the sense that the risk factors uh, and are very different in Asia and maybe the biology is even somewhat different in Asia. Effects of environment are different. And then of course, Asians have unique genetics. All of that adds up, as you can see in this figure on the left, uh, in say coronary artery disease mortality, even at the same cholesterol level, okay, if you go from country to country, you'll see a dramatic change in uh, risk of coronary artery disease uh, tenfold, up to tenfold difference, right, at the same cholesterol level. And so that means that there's something in genes and environment that's changing across these populations. And so if you do your genomics in one population and try to learn disease that way, you may not, your conclusions may not generalize, okay? And as we move to the era of precision medicine, it's really important to do your data analysis and do your data generation in countries all over, and populations all over the world. On the right-hand side, again, you see prevalence of diabetes is uh, substantially different across different ethnicities. So for precision medicine to really be successful, it has to be precise enough to accommodate this diversity across the world. It cannot be only European uh, profiling. Right? And that's where Human Cell Atlas Asia comes in. So Asia has, uh, many of you may be familiar with human cell, the Global Human Cell Atlas. Its goal is to define or come up with a periodic table of human cell types. Human Cell Atlas Asia is the Asian chapter of that. And uh, Asia is obviously important. It houses 60% of the world's population, including China and India, two most populous countries, and really abundant genetic, ethnic, cultural, environmental, socioeconomic diversity. So we need Asian science to cover all this diversity. And so as the flagship program of Human Cell Atlas Asia, we launched IDA, the Asian Immune Diversity Atlas, across five countries. The leftmost is Singapore, and Singapore has a major advantage in profiling genetic diversity because we have three major ethnicities, Chinese, Malay, Indian, all living in the same small city state under more or less similar environmental conditions. Uh, and then next is Japan. So a uh, Jap uh, Japan collaborator, uh, Jay Shin, is driving that arm. And then Wung Yang Park is driving the South Korea arm of AIDA. Pata Majumdar in India, and Vardam Chara and so on in uh, Mahidol University in Thailand. So five countries, six ethnicities, and AIDA wants to build a single cell atlas of Asian immune cell states, initially healthy. So initially we're just looking at PB and Cs from healthy cohorts, but then we'll all branch out into our um, topics of interest, our diseases of interest, and use the healthy cohort as a reference. But even in the healthy cohort, we hope to say how much diversity is there in Asia? And really no one has asked this question at a single cell level across multiple countries and ethnicities. So this is, uh, I'd say, a discovery process and we don't know what we'll find. And then of course, you'll compare to disease cohorts. I should thank uh, Chan Zuckerberg uh, for this, uh, Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. So they have funded AIDA and also ASTAR has funded it as well. So AIDA is the flagship HCA Asia program and it's teaching us a lot about how to do this kind of study. Okay. And genomics, as it goes global and multinational, becomes larger and larger. We need to do this kind of consortium-based science. Right? So here's, I've mentioned the country leads in the AIDA team, but there's many other um, team leaders as well within AIDA. And uh, in Singapore, we have John Chambers and Don Chong driving it and then uh, in Japan, Chung and Ariel. In India, Ankita and Ardham. Uh, 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 sorry, Ankita and Arindam. In Thailand, uh, Ponpan. And of course, uh, Ian Tan as well, uh, colorectal cancer collaborator. So very large consortium. And hopefully it will grow even larger. We, it's an open consortium. We're looking for more countries to join. So what are we going to do in this pilot phase? So this is not comprehensive, but already fairly broad, I think. 
we want to do single cell RNA seq and attack seq on 500 samples, and then try to correct or reduce batch effects profile, not just transcriptome, but uh, immune, you know, BCR, TCR uh, receptor diversity, and then see how all of this changes across population groups, male versus female across environments and submit the data to the human cell atlas. Uh, one very valuable technique we have in IDA is multiplex single cell genomics. And I should thank Jimmy Yee from UCSF for that. He really pioneered this method of uh, reducing batch effects and reducing costs and reducing even labor right, in this kind of large study where you're profiling lots of samples. So what is this multiplexed single cell genomics? You pull, so on the top left you see here, you have eight, you can say eight colors for eight different samples. In our case, these are eight, let's say eight vials of PBMCs from eight people. We pool those PBMCs into one single pool and process it as one reaction, or actually in our case, two reactions on the 10X genomics uh, chromium system. And then, uh, so the tennis machine and the single cell RNA-seq uh, assay does not know that this is eight, eight people. It thinks it's just one pool of samples, right? So at the end, you get single cell RNA-seq from, let's say, uh, 30,000 cells from, uh, or let, let's say from eight people, I'll say around 16,000 cells, okay? How do you know which of those cells is from each of those eight donors? And that's where we use Jimmy's algorithm so it looks at the genotypes of the single cell RNA-seq reads, and then based on the genotypes, it matches the reads to the donors. And I should say the matching is not read level, it's barcode level. And each single cell, bar, each barcode marks one single cell. And if you take all the genotypes from all the reads for that barcode, you can say, okay, you know, across the whole genome, the genotypes are mapping individual A or individual B, and that's how you do the uh, demultiplexing, so to speak and split it into eight separate single cell RNA-seq data sets. So that's what we're using in IDA. In IDA, we actually uh, profile pool 16 samples at a time. That's even more scalable. Now, uh, those 16 samples are from 15 individuals plus one common control. And that's a really important thing when you're doing a multi-site study. These common controls are uh, European origin PBMC samples that all of the countries are purchasing from a common vendor. And so in each batch, we'll profile at least one such control sample so that if there is a batch effect or is a difference in processing across the countries, we will be able to see it in that common control, a shift in the common control, and we'll be able to ideally correct it. So we load 40,000 cells in each 10X reaction, and that's heavily overloading, uh, not officially recommended, but that's what we're doing. Uh, and our goal is to recover about 18,000 single cells per reaction after QC. And that's about, we're getting about 16,000 cells, I think. Uh, so 16,000 cells from per reaction, 16 samples, so that's 1,000 cells per individual. So we did two 10x reactions, so we get 2,000 cells per individual. And then we sequence it in one lane. These two reactions are sequenced in one lane of a NovaSeq S4 chip. And that gives us enough reads. It gives us about 40,000 reads per cell. And we said we have good quality PBMC single cell RNA-seq data. Uh, now, uh, that's the protocol, right? But if you want to do any large scale study, uh, there's a lot of work, maybe one year of work that comes before one and a half years of work that comes before you do any data generation. And step one, we're very fortunate to have excellent collaborators, and I showed you all their names earlier. That's the most important ingredient, I would say, in a successful consortium. And they have to be willing to work towards the same goals, share methods, share data, share technologies. Only then this kind of omics project works. Standardize a questionnaire across all sites, confirm that data can be shared, standardized sample collection protocol. And I'm happy to say we share our protocols openly on protocols.io. So anyone can go to protocols.io and search for us and they'll find the protocols that we use for either. And we use a common control, as I mentioned, 
we standardize a batch randomization strategy, so randomizing age, sex within a batch, uh, standardize a single cell processing protocol, centralized DNA sequencing, all in Singapore for IDA. We centralize a primary data analysis, which is again in Singapore for IDA, and then we federate the secondary data analysis. We send the uh, you know, QC passed, cleaned up cells, clustered into specific cell types, we send it back to the individual donor labs according uh, along with the raw data so that they can all do, all do their downstream analysis independently. So a lot of machinery that went into this and uh, I should not leave out that a lot of algorithm development and pipeline development went into this as well. If you want to harmonize and get clean data across sites, you have to be very, very careful about the protocol you use on the dry lab side as well. It starts, of course, with the raw data. And since it's 10x data, we use Cell Ranger version 4.0. Um, and this, all, all, of, all of the steps in this pipeline, I should say, for IDA are done in Singapore in one place. So there's no problem about harmonizing. So Cell Ranger gives us a gene cell matrix. We do a loose, very generous QC and discard, uh, basically just discard empty droplets. And we get the filter gene cell matrix. Then we run Dmuxlet doublet finder to get rid of doublets and assign cells to their donor. So then we have uh, semi cleaned up demultiplexed single cells. And then we run RCA2, which I'll talk about in a minute, which is our supervised clustering algorithm to assign each cell to a major cell type. And then for each major cell type, we start all over again on the QC. So as I mentioned earlier, we did loose QC. Now we do tighter QC. It turns out that the QC parameters for each major cell type, let's say B cells, T cells, monocytes, uh, NK cells, they're all slightly different. Okay? So we do separate QC cutoffs for each major cell type identified by RCA. Then we have our post QC final, final, final cleaned up cells. And then we use various algorithms, including Surat data integration, to see if there the are any batch effects at the end of all this. Um, and I'll show you some examples in a minute after I give you some details about the algorithms. So RCA, uh, RCA2 is available now. We publish RCA1 in Nature Genetics in 2017. And uh, RCA2 is not published yet, but it's all, already available on GitHub and freely download, downloadable. Feel free to use it and contact us if you have any questions. The essential uh, trick or method in RCA is that we cluster cells not de novo. Okay, so most single cell RNA-C clustering methods are de novo. You just look at the data and you see how similar the cells are to each other and you identify clumps of cells by transcriptomic similarity and each clump of cells in gene expression space is a cell type. RCA does it differently. RCA uses additional information in the clustering. And that's what makes RCA clustering very, very clean. So in this figure that you can see, each column is a cell and each row is a reference transcriptome that RCA projects these cells onto. And now you can see how the clustering becomes extraordinarily clean, okay? So in your top left-hand corner, you have this red box of cells, so which look very much like monocytes. Uh, and so those are your myeloid cells in your PBMCs. And on the right-hand side, you have, again, myeloid cells in a bo small box on the right. And those are non-classical monocytes and uh, dendritic cells. And then you have a very sharp box in the bottom, naive B cells, your plasma cytoidendritic cells, CD8 effector memory, NK, B4 effector memory, and so on. So as you can see, you get very, very sharp clustering when you take each cell and say, how similar is it to all of these reference transcriptomes? And so RCA cluster cells in this reference transcriptome space, and that's what we're using for IDA, in addition to Surat, of course, for de novo. Now, what's the benefit of this? Uh, on your right-hand side, you see what happens if you do de novo clustering of cells from two different pro protocols, in this case, 10 genomic single cell RNA-seq and DROP-seq. The cells cluster in the red cells and blue cells from the two different protocols. They cluster separately. And typically, you have to do 
uh, a fairly sophisticated data integration method to try to match the red cells to the blue cells, okay? RCA doesn't need all that. Even without explicit batch correction, you can see the red cells and blue cells are clustered exactly on top of each other by RCA because the reference projection gets rid of most of the batch effects in the data. Not all, but most of the batch effects. And so we found that RCA is very, very, very powerful method for clustering primary samples in the presence of batch effects. Another algorithm we use is dub stepper. So even before you cluster your single cells, you want to say which features you use. And by features, I mean genes, right? If you cluster cells based on cell type specific markers, you'll get beautifully clean clustering. If you cluster cells based on, let's say ribosomal genes, you'll get pretty crummy clustering. So the genes you use for your clustering really matter. So we have an algorithm called dub stepper that's already on bioarchive. The bioarchive link is down below. For identifying the right genes to use for feature selection and single cell clustering, as you can see on the left for PBMC data, we identify a very small uh, rare population of contaminating, uh, I think this is basophils in this case, if I remember correctly, uh, in single cell RNA-seq data. Um, and so dub stepper, if you find the right features, right, you can get uh, very, very rare subpopulations in your data. Uh, this is just an anecdote on the left. On the right, you see dub stepper benchmarking across, I think, eight different single cell RNA seq data sets, smart seq clinics, genomics, um, many different protocols. And we take the average performance of these various algorithms across various numbers of marker genes. And you can see that dub stepper is a red line on the top. It always gives you the sharpest clustering. It separates different cell types much, I would say more cleanly than the other methods. Uh, and if you want to learn more about Dubstep, I encourage you to look at the bioarchive manuscript, the preprint, uh, and it's Dubstep is also available for download. Uh, we are doing a lot more in the algorithm development space, but uh, I'll move to the benefits of all of this methodology, right? So I've talked to you a lot about methodology and we tend to obsess about it, but in the end, you want to look at the data from all of that. And here we have finally, 49,000 single cells PBMCs from Japan, South Korea, and Singapore, all integrated together. You can see you have all the major cell types, PBMCs, and you also have these funny platelet clumps, which often show up. Now, are we seeing any major batch effects was a question, right? And before that first, we uh, identified some, you see the red cells here, they are the low quality cells. We filtered them out. And now this is our cleaned up UMAP of the IDA cells from three countries, and it's 43,000 cells. Now you look at those 43,000 cells, you can see that cells from all three countries are very evenly distributed across this entire UMAP, right? So that means we're not seeing any major batch effects, which is quite remarkable considering that cells were, samples were independently collected and independently processed in three different countries. And so that's a benefit of our data integration and protocol harmonization. We have very similar cell type proportions across the three, three countries. And we have uh, T cell receptor and B cell receptor, very diverse samples detected, uh, uh, diverse array of clones in each sample. And so we're ready now. We validated that our protocol harmonization works, and we're ready now to scale up to 500 samples. Um, okay, I, I'm gonna, I, I mentioned a lot of this. So uh, just to summarize, IDA has, I think IDA can serve as a paradigm for consortium-based single cell studies. I'll move on to other, so actual disease studies. So IDA was healthy PBMCs, but we have, we're working with Wunyang Park, in South Korea, Samsung Genome Institute to study, do single cell analysis of colorectal tumors. And in Singapore, it's driven by Ian Tan, a collaborator at NCCS. Here you see a UMAP of 270,000 cells from colorectal tumors and nearby normal, nicely divided into the major cell types. And this is Singapore data, but we're also comparing to data from South Korea and actually data from our collaborator, Sabine Tejpar, Belgium, 
who has also very generously um, shared her data. As, uh, so we are all three countries are sharing data as part of this consortium. What are we learning from this colorectal cancer single cell RNA seq analysis? Uh, first, something very intriguing. A lot of people have tried to say, how is the core of the tumor different from the invasive edge of the tumor? But so far in the single cell RNA seq field, there hasn't been much progress in this area. So, to at first glance, the cells in the core of the tumor and the invasive edge, they seem to have the same transcriptomes, right? But biologically, it doesn't make too much sense because the tumor core is necrotic and slow growing, and the invasive edge is more well uh, supplied uh, with blood and oxygen and um, growing much more rapidly. So we are very excited to see here uh, that there are some differences in distribution between the red cells and the green cells, cells from the core and invasive edge of the tumor. And uh, that, that tells us that perhaps the cells, the fibroblasts in the invasive edge of the tumor may have something to do with the invasive properties of those epithelial cells. On the other hand, fibroblasts in the core of the tumor may be keeping it alive and protecting it from uh, drugs. So uh, that's an ongoing work. Not just fibroblasts, we looked at endothelial cells also. We're looking at various cell types in colon tumors. Here you can see fibroblasts and endothelial cells colored by whether they are from normal or tumor. Okay, Broadly, the light blue cells are from normal and the red cells are from tumor. Now, the very weird thing we see is that the normal cells, you can see they're very well separated out in the transcriptome space. There are many different subtypes. But the tumor fibroblasts, for whatever reason, they lose their cell type identity. Right? They get blurry and they smeared out all over. They essentially form bridges between these normal fibroblast subtypes. And that is a very intriguing phenomenon. And we were wondering if it's general. So we looked at endothelial cells. Even in the case of endothelial cells, you can see that the light blue cells from normal endothelium, normal colonic tissue, they separate out clearly, they form subtypes, but the tumor endothelial cells smear out the differences between the subtypes. They essentially lose their subtype identity. Uh, very peculiar behavior. We didn't see, so and these are both uh, mesenchymal-like cells, you can say, if not mesenchymal. Um, uh, but uh, fibroblasts and endothelial cells have very similar transcriptomes. So regardless of whether you consider endothelial cells as mesenchymal or not. So, uh, and in both cases, we see this loss of cell identity. We didn't really see it in other cell subtypes. So we're exploring what this means for tumor biology or CRC. But uh, at least we can say that this is not a fluke and this is not just single cell weird phenotypes we're seeing in Singapore. We actually integrated our data from Moon Yang's lab and Sabine's lab in South Korea and Belgium. And we see more or less the same fibroblast subtypes across all three countries. So that's very reassuring. Now I've spoken about CRC. We're also very excited to collaborate with Sintiong Ong in Singapore and also Charles Chua and Wee Ju uh, to do something a bit different. So the goal of this study single cell uh, analysis of CML, is very specifically to identify markers that can tell you whether a patient is going to respond well or respond badly to tyrosine kinase inhibitors at diagnosis. Right? So we, we have three groups of patients. Group A is good prognosis, group B is intermediate, group C is treatment failure. And uh, for these three groups, we're doing single cell RNA-C to say, can we see molecular traits in single cell RNA seq that allows us to allow us to predict how these people will respond in future to uh, TKI treatment? And if we can predict it, we can really intervene early for these group C individuals, for example, and treat them more aggressively. So this is very specifically a translationally focused single cell biomarker study. And very excitingly, as you can see from these four UMAPs, right? It's also the same UMAP colored by origin of the cells. Cells from group A, group B, and group C patients were broadly overlapping, but they seem to inhabit different regions of your transcriptome space. This suggests to us that we can uh, 
get uh, biomarkers from, uh, from this data that can allow us to predict their outcome. So to conclude, we're seeing systematic differences of various types of cell states in colorectal cancer, and uh, we're interested in exploring that to see how it can predict drug response even for CRC and identify new drug targets. And for CML, we're already seeing promising glimmers of uh, predictive biomarkers from single cell data. So I'd like to thank my group and I mentioned all of our collaborators already. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Shine. Nice work on the algorithm development. And attendees, this is your chance to ask questions to him. Just submit your questions on the Q&A box and he will address them during the um, Q&A sessions. Um, okay. Um, up next, um, hold on. I think I couldn't see my mouse. Okay, and up next um, is our last presenter from um, Kyoto University, Japan. He is Dr. Watanabe Akira, serving as a program-specific associate director in the Graduate School of Medicine. He heads his team on stem cell research with the world's first generations of mouse and human iPSCs using single iPSCs to study epigenesis in more than 10 tissue types to discover stem cell and mRNA sequencing transcriptomase for regenerative medicine. And today, he will bring us his research insights on single cell transcriptome analysis, dissects a sequence of replicating process of pancreatic beta cells. Let's welcome him. Uh, thank you very much for kind introduction and uh, giving me uh, such a nice opportunity. Thank you very much. Today, I will talk about our recent research using single cell RNA sequencing, which was accepted this week. The title is Single Cell Transcriptome Analysis Dissects the Sequence of Replicating Process of a Beta Cell of the Pancreas. Uh, this is our history with the single cell transcriptomics. On 2012, we joined early access program of Fluidimes C1 cell autoprep, which was a first generation automatic device for single cell transcriptomics. And we installed one of the three first lots of the C1. At the moment, only 19 cells could be analyzed at once. My colleague said the, uh, something trouble. Um, hi, Dr. Watanabe. Oh, yeah, okay, we can see your slide now. Thank you very much. Thank you. So I'm sorry. So, um, so uh, on the uh, 1912, we uh, installed the C1 auto prep, and then uh, we applied the technology using the C1 to uh, IPS cell based regenerative medicine. On 2014, a first in human study using IPS cell derived retinal cells was conducted in Japan. My team played a role in the assessment of the cell from the view of genome and epigenome integrity. Uh, we conducted single cell gene expression analysis for the uh, clinical grade uh, IPS cell derived retinal cells and confirmed 100% of the, our cells were precisely differentiated into desirable cell types. As I know, that was a first study uh, that applied a single cell transcriptomics to the medicine. Uh, today, um, uh, I will talk uh, the another, to uh, another topic. Uh, I will introduce our recent study analyzing beta cells of the pancreas, which have been accepted this week. Diabetic hypoglycemia is a low blood glucose level occurring in a person with a diabetes mellitus. Type 2 diabetes is characterized by impaired insulin secretion resulting from dysfunction of the pancreas beta cells and or a reduction in a beta cell mass in addition to 
insulin resistance in the peripheral tissues. Previous studies showed self-replication of pre-existing beta cells plays the most important role in the maintenance of the beta cell mass in adult mass. However, replication rate of the beta cell in adult human and mass is extremely low as a result of its gradual decrease with the aging uh, from the highest replication after birth. We address molecular basis of physiological replication proliferation of the pancreatic beta cells. To study this, several animal models have been developed from other groups. One is acquisition of the beta uh, insulin resistance, induction of the hyperglycemia, pregnancy model, beta cell ablation, administration of the glucokinase activator, and the partially pancreatotomy PPTX model. Uh, we applied a uh, PPTX model for the fo following studies. In this study, to activate the replication of the beta cell, we conducted resection of the 50% of the pancreas on the young mice at eight week old age. And old mice, also old mice, uh, um, resection to the uh, old mass at uh, 52 weeks old. And we observed that PPTX induced mild hyperglycemia both in uh, young and old mice, whereas the obvious change were not seen in the body weight, glucose tolerance, and the insulin secretion in agreement with the previous reports. So we Conducted in, in, vivo, in vivo labeling of the islet cells with the BRDU incorporation. So please see the uh, um, left panel. We demonstrated that proliferating insulin BRDU double positive cells uh, showing in a red and a green colors in a, a immunocyte chemistry here. Uh, these uh, proliferating cells were significantly high in a uh, young PPTX mice. Also, very little number of the proliferating cells uh, labeling with the red color uh, were observed in a uh, young control and also old both control and the PPTX mice. So right panel showed the uh, um, quantity of the uh, proliferating beta cells. Uh, we can see the uh, almost the 4% uh, of the uh, PPTX young mice show the uh, proliferating states, even though uh, young control or the control and the PPTX mice did not show any uh, high proliferating ratio. Uh, this is our materials. Uh, so I will talk about the uh, conventional RNA-seq data, uh, the first part, and then uh, followed by a uh, single cell RNA-seq. So for the uh, uh, young control mice, uh, sorry, uh, for the uh, conventional uh, bulk RNA-seq, we conducted the uh, four groups, control and the PPTX for young mice, and also control and the PPTX for old mice. After two days operation, we isolated of the uh, islet, and then we conducted the uh, conventional RNA-seq, bulk RNA-seq. So this is a volcano plot showing the uh, a significantly uh, uh, differentially expressed gene. As seen in the uh, left panel showing the uh, young result, we could see many of the genes were highly expressed in a PPTX with the uh, red colors, 
or decreased in the PPTX uh, leveling with the uh, blue. Significant feature of the uh, highly expressed in the PPTX was ER stress responder, including the uh, PDIA4, HSPA5, and also replication related genes, MCM families. In contrast, old mice did not exhibit such large change by a PPTX treatment. However, our conventional bulk analysis could not state whether altered gene expression profiles represented the majority of the islet cells or reflected some induction of the genes in a rare population such as a replicating beta cells. This is the motivation of, uh, to conduct the following analysis at single cell level. Very, so, very sorry for uh, 10x genomics. Uh, uh, in this study, uh, we uh, used um, Biorados DD seq So this is the principle of the uh, DD seq but the, uh, um, both of the uh, 10X and the DD seq Biorados one uh, is based on the uh, droplet generation. First, we generated the emergon by high speed of flow of the uh, water into the void. So we uh, generate the droplet as a uh, ultra small tubes. So and then uh, the cell concentration is very low to realize the incorporation of the single cell in a one droplet. Each RNA molecules can be separately recognized using the unique molecular identifier of uh, realizing the, uh, we could obtain um, single cell derived uh, sequencing libraries. This is a video for generating the uh, uh, droplet, but the, uh, actually uh, uh, this is uh, limited by our uh, uh, video specs. So uh, actually a more many uh, uh, droplet was generated. So um, uh, we sometimes feel difficulty in a library preparation from tissue samples. Our samples in this study, uh, added from the pancreas, were also a difficult target for library preparation for uh, single cell RNA seq. Uh, this um, figure shows the uh, um, bioanalyzer result. Both left and right uh, sharp peak show the um, Ladder marker, uh, markers uh, showing the uh, um, minimum size and the maximum size of the uh, electrograms. So uh, in general, uh, we could see the uh, broad peaks uh, between the two sh sharp peaks, like right panel. However, initial uh, experiment for our cases could not see any good quality and a good uh, enough quantity of the libraries was observed. So we altered the protocol, including a cell preparation and a number of the cell as an input, and finally obtained the good and uh, nice quality, like here. This is not the, uh, our uh, uh, today's talk data. I mean, uh, this is not a pancreas result. However, uh, I wanna share our experience uh, for importance of the sample preparation. Uh, this example is the uh, in vitro uh, organ organoid model. So we did the uh, A and B samples for three times. Experiment one, a very fast experiment, we could not obtain enough number of the cell after filtration of the data. 
So then we improved the uh, several uh, conditions. Uh, the second experiment seems to be better uh, compared to the uh, experiment one. However, not enough for us. We improve, repeatedly improved the uh, uh, relook, the uh, condition of the experiment, and uh, finally, uh, uh, this experiment we targeted uh, theoretically 5,000 cells. The uh, experiment three uh, gave us the, uh, our um, theoretically theoretical target number of the cell. So we continued the analysis using the experiment of three data. However, this is not the uh, today talk uh, pamphlet I talk data. Just the uh, sharing of our experience. So going back to the uh, pancreatic iris cells, uh, we could obtain the appropriate data uh, quality of the data. To overview gene expression profile of each cell, we conducted dimensional reduction by a uniform manifold approximation and the projection uh, in terms of the UMAP. And the UMAP visualized classification of the islet cells into six subpopulations. We defined each cluster cells because there are uh, so popular uh, cell marker for each endocrine cells of the pancreas. We defined in three one expressing cluster one, two, four, one, two, three, four at the beta cell. PPY or somatostatin SSY expressing cluster five at the uh, PP or delta cell. And glucagon GCG expressing cluster six at the uh, alpha cell. In the clusters with the uh, insulin one expression, a uh, cluster one, two, three, four, a proportion of the cluster four cells exhibited statistically significant difference between the PPTX and the control groups. Proposing this cluster was a replicate, replicating beta cell population. A significance of this study is to describe stoichiometric analysis. For each group, from class of one to six, we conducted four independent experiments using different mice. One dot shows one experiment showing uh, we did, we conducted a four experiment for each control and PPTX. We could see high producibility in a four experiment. Especially a proportion of the class of four cells was concordant with the immunocyte chemistry immunohistochemistry of BRDU positive cells showing the upper panel, uh, like the 4% um, or around for a proliferating beta cell. And in our single cell RNA seq also exhibited 4% or around cells were belonging in a cluster four, showing the high reproducibility in a replicate. So we then conducted cell cycle scoring analysis using the uh, cell cycle related gene expression profiles. We also demonstrated that class of four cells were in a S or G2M phase, whereas the uh, the other beta cell clusters, cluster one, two, three, exhibited mixed status of the cell cycle, including not only the uh, D2M or S, but also the G0, G1 cells were existing in a cluster one, one, two, three. We further confirmed the high expression of the cell cycle 
created gene, including the uh, MKI67, uh, the protein of the uh, KI67, and the PCNA, and concluded that the cluster four cells were replicating beta cells. Pseudo time course analysis displays a trajectory of the cell from the cluster one through the uh, cluster two, three, and to the uh, cluster four, demonstrating that the uh, trajectory recapitulated a process of the transition to the uh, replication state of the beta cell. We indeed observed switching expression of the cyclins in a trajectory, recapitulating the uh, cell cycle transition from DLG1 S to the uh, G2M phases. This is the uh, GO analysis for each cluster. We could see the uh, decreased uh, um, high expression of the uh, ER related gene in a cluster three and the uh, high expression of the cell cycle related gene in a cluster four in a GO analysis. Another view of the uh, gene expression profile like the uh, beta cell function genes, ER stress, uh, proliferation related genes and the cell cycle initiator or uh, tumor suppressors exhibited the uh, unique profile for each cluster. For example, beta cell function, uh, like the uh, um, NKI 6.1 and the UCN3 uh, showed the uh, decreased expression in a cluster four, whereas proliferation related gene uh, like uh, top 2 a MKI 67 was uh, highly expressed in a cluster four. As I told you, in a geo analysis, uh, we could see the uh, transient expression at the class of three was observed for uh, ER threat responder HSP5 and the ATF6 beta. Surprisingly, we found a progression of the uh, several tumor suppressors like BRCA1, 2, and the uh, P53 at class of four. This is another table. Expression of the E2F family genes, such as E2F1, 2, 3, cell progression worker, including the top 2 a PCNA, FOXM1, and MKI67, cycling inhibitors, P21, P14, P53, P16, and uh, P18, and the regulators of double strand breaks, repair enzymes like uh, check one, check two, rad 51, were elevated to the uh, cluster four. We also observed the application of the uh, epigenetic regulators like DNMT3A and uh, EGA2 in a cluster four. As I told you very interestingly, uh, we could see the uh, uh, high expression of uh, tumor suppressors to the uh, cluster four. And also, uh, both typical ETFs, ETF1, 2, 3, this is the, uh, uh, activating the cell cycle entry genes. And also, a typical ETF, ETF7 and 8, these are known as uh, cell cycle inhibitors, were also upregulated in the cluster 4. I mean, um, from the view of the uh, cell cycle regulation, both uh, accelerator ETFs and inhibitor of cell cycle regulator, ETF7 and 8, were simultaneously abrogated in a cluster four. To address whether our uh, transcriptional signature of the beta cell replication observed in mouse was modeled on a replication process of the human pancreatic beta cells, we compared to the human insulinomers, DILC1 inhibitor inducing the beta cell replication, 
and juvenile human islets from the previous reports. Of 440 genes enriched in a cluster 4, uh, we observed the uh, overlapped gene, including the uh, replicating related genes such as uh, MKI67, FOXM1, CCN82, CCN uh, cycling B1, cycling E2, and the tumor suppressor genes. Uh, like uh, uh, BRCA1, BRCA2, and BIRD1. In addition, uh, it's a family genes of uh, E2F128 and uh, uh, epigenetic regulator EJ2 and HERDS were also aggregated in a human data set. We finally examined molecular mechanisms of transcriptional regulation, writing dynamic change in a gene expression during transition. We examined motifs enriched on the promoters of differentially expressed genes, and we observed high enrichment of the E2F binding motifs on the promoters of a cluster four specific genes. While DNA binding motif among E2F family protein is very similar and indistinguishable, However, uh, gene expression profile suggested that E2F1, 2, 3, 7, 8 regulated downstream gene uh, uh, in the cluster 4 uh, through their binding motif. Because any cluster specific uh, enrichment were not observed in the cluster 2 and 3, we further dissected uh, regulation of the dynam dynamic gene regulation using their pseudo uh, temporal expression pattern in a right panel. We found high enrichment of the f 6 atf 6 b binding motifs, that is the ERZ stress responder, on the promoters, which were transiently expressed on the, in transition to the uh, replication. This is a cartoon of our transcriptional dynamics in a physiological replication proposed by our single cell RNA seq. First, we successfully uh, ordered the cells based on their cell cycle status. Uh, first, we observed the uh, uh, D type cycling expression and followed by a uh, cycling E, A type, and the B type cycling expression. We found transient expression of the ER threat responders may be indicating that the, uh, this ER stress uh, may be an initiator of the uh, cell cycle entry. And we observed the uh, high expression of uh, cell cycle uh, accelerator genes uh, like the uh, ETF families and also the uh, PCNA and the KI67. As well as well, that, uh, we surprisingly observed the high expression of tumor suppressors like uh, BRCA1 and 2. And also uh, P53, TRP53 uh, is a, a human P53. And also we observed the high expression of the uh, uh, RB1. So that is the uh, um, in opposite regulation for cell cycle acceleration. But we think that the uh, these uh, expression of the tumor suppressors is a very important for physiological replication of the beta cell because uh, we have to escape the beta cells from the uh, tumor genesis. So finally, uh, I would like to express my uh, sincerely acknowledgement to the, uh, my uh, group members, especially Satoko Sakamoto, and also the uh, experiment and uh, data analysis groups. Today's model was gifted from the uh, uh, Professor Inagaki's group, uh, with the, uh, especially uh, Dr. Tatsuoka uh, played the main role in uh, uh, preparation of the beta cells. Uh, we also uh, gave uh, uh, Dr. Yabe at the Giggs University gave me a, a very nice suggestion. Thank you very much for uh, everyone, and also the, uh, uh, thank you very much for audience. Thank you very much. 
Thank you, Dr. Watanabe. That's interesting work. I can predict a future for diabetics and cancer that can be treated by harvesting the result from single cell sequencing research or beta cells. Okay, we may have overrun the time, but I really would like to go through three questions we have picked that's good, great for you know, um, everyone to discuss and before we end uh, the meeting. And to Dr. Watanabe, a question for you. We see a whole lot of research applying single cell sequencing on biology studies. What other area can single cell sequencing be applied to? What do you think about plant and microbiology? <laughs> I'm not an expert of the uh, microbiology, but uh, because the, uh, my uh, research career is only for the uh, human uh, uh, transcriptomics. So, um, but the, uh, I think the, uh, um, uh, it can be applied for the uh, such field. So, um, but I think the, uh, there are uh, several technical uh, issues like the uh, size of the cells or something. Uh, so <laughs> that's everything I can say, I'm sorry. No problems. How about Dr. Shime and uh, Dr. Min? What do you think about uh, whether single cell sequencing can be applied to plant and microbiology? Um, you want to go first, Min? <laughs> um, well, I, I have to say that these are uh, early days. Uh, again, I think um, to, to Dr. Watanabe and I think Dr. Shime's work, a lot of our collaborators and customers have been using on humans. But we do see a lot more working on plants. There are a few and also um, I think Visium as well trying to get both uh, single cell and spatial to work on plants. So look, for, look, look forward to that. Um, microbes is probably a bit challenging because as I responded in one of the questions, um, we are uh, more or less focused on the poly-A transcripts. So um, it's okay if your, your microbe uh, expresses poly-A transcripts, but if they don't, then it's a bit more challenging. Yeah, uh, I'll leave it to you, Sean. Uh, thanks, Min. Uh, yeah, as you mentioned, Microbes are challenging, so I haven't seen a whole lot of microbial single cell RNA seq studies. Uh, nevertheless, uh, you know, even if they're not poly dentalated, they, they just come along for the ride anyway. Um, uh, some, quite often, if you're doing the host transcriptome, so I think it'll be very interesting to look for stray microbial reads in human cell or mouse. Uh, cool. cell RNA is that data. something you think you could and tease out with your data analysis work? Actually, so I, I think it's Ido Amit who's come up with this viral tracker or something algorithm that pulls out uh, viral COVID RNA seq uh, reads, or co COVID reads from infected human lung single cell RNA seq data. So we've tried that with. PBM, COVID, PBMC data, we have not seen any viral RNA. Maybe because in the PBMCs, you don't have viral infection. It's more in the lung. But yeah, I, I think it's, it's methods like this are possible. But just if you're talking about individual microbial, microbial cells, it might be more challenging. Plant is also challenging. There hasn't been a lot of plant single cell RNA-seq data because the cell wall is, is quite strong. And sometimes the plant cells are huge and the dissociation is tricky also. But there are some plant singles that people have solved the problem in some cases and done, I think, smart seek, if not 10x genomics on plant cells. So I think really the field can advance in that, in that direction as the protocols improve to accommodate that. Okay, thank you, um, Dr. Shime, um, Dr. Min, and Dr. Watanabe. Okay, um, we found a few questions interesting for the audiences, and uh, that has been asked about this, uh, you know, from the questions that submitted and even from the floor just now. Um, is biological replicates required for single cell gene expressions and spatial transcriptome? So, to the audiences, what do you think about it? Um, here's a poll question, and uh, we will feature the result on the screen um, in a while. So. Okay, I see interesting um, votes coming in. Okay, I'll end the poll right now for discussion. Is biological replicates rep required for single cell gene expression and spatial transcriptome? So um, what, what do um, you know, speakers think about this? Um, maybe I can take that. I'm really surprised people said no. I mean, <laughs> Me too. <laughs> so today I chose the uh, replicate, but uh, I think the uh, um, uh, this is a very uh, 
specific cases, but it, it's very high cost, so uh, we can uh, not <laughs> do the, so much experiment, I think. Sorry, Sham, I think you were, you're on mute just now for a little bit. Yeah, I, I don't know. I think I cut myself off, but uh, I, 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 I take your point that, yeah, it's, it's expensive and you can't always do replicates. And also, if you just want to identify cell types, maybe you can profile 100,000 cells, 200,000 cells from one individual and uh, go really deep and identify cell types that way. But ultimately, what, what we found is when we're doing disease versus control uh, analysis, there, of course, we need replicates. And we find that um, if you're lucky, sometimes with five disease versus five control, you can find good signals. It really depends on how strong the signal is, right? But we like to have at least 10 versus 10, 10 disease versus 10 control when we're doing this analysis, single cell analysis. Okay, any more to add? Okay, um, this is really, this is like a question that's very interesting for NGS experiment, especially that single cell and spatial transcriptomics are pretty new technology and many researchers um, probably might be unclear at this stage. And um, thank you the speakers uh, for answering these questions and to the poll que survey that was conducted, you know, um, at the very beginning, I apologize for not concluding the result whether frozen cells can be used for single cell. Um, I will share the results and I'll have Xiao Wei to conclude that. Xiao Wei? Hi, can you hear me, right? I think yes. for this question, the answer is yes. Uh, I, I think for gene tissue, we can isolate the nuclei, nucleus for gene expression. And another choice, of course, is to use the spatial transcriptomics to uh, perform the gene expression or frozen tissue. Uh, am I right, man, Dr. Min? Yep. But this will be a come to the end of the webinar, and we hope you have enjoyed and gained another new perspective to approach your research analysis with single cell and spatial transcriptomy. And to help us cater more of such interesting content for you, please help us to do a short survey when you exit the Zoom platform. I would like to thank all presenters, Dr. Shine, Dr. Watanabe, Dr. Min, Xiao Hui, and of course, to all my dear audiences here. And um, take care and stay safe, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for the invite. Bye. Bye-bye. Okay.